Well, I wanted to begin by, um, by once again thanking uh, Professor Torres Neff. She has done just an incredible job here. None of this would have been possible without her. Uh, doing all the organization, reaching out to all the speakers. Um, so please, everybody, let's please thank her. Um, before I uh, begin uh, in introducing uh, Dr. DeClue again, I wanted to just make a brief remark about this concept of continuity that was mentioned this morning during our first panel. Um, in a particular way, uh, there is quite a bit of continuity uh, in this event for me, and that has made it particularly delightful for me outside of the, um, the wonderful talks themselves. Um, Dr. DeClue was a student here at Belmont Abbey when I was a student. Um, and I remember many talks uh, with him down at Clancy's. For some reason, I have a particular memory of, of being with him in Clancy's and being uh, intensely impressed with his intellect. And while there were a number of professors here at Belmont Abbey who inspired me to go on um, and do my, my uh, postgraduate uh, work and come back and teach, uh, conversations with a fellow student and seeing uh, an intellect of the highest uh, caliber uh, in Dr. DeClue was one of them. Uh, in addition, Dr. Thomas, um, it was mentioned that he received the Weaver Prize before. The first time I met Dr. Thomas was when I was a student here at Belmont Abbey. He was not a professor, but he came to um, something called the Weaver Ingersoll Symposiums, or uh, symposia that were held every year by our old president, Dr. Um, Preston, gosh, yeah, uh, the, the Abbott's brother-in-law, he'd kill me if, I, if he saw it. So um, uh, these were just these wonderful uh, talks, and I remember sitting with him and um, David Whalen, who's now at Hillsdale, sitting around talking about uh, David Brooks, Bobos in Paradise, and Walker Percy. And so uh, these, these men who were on this last panel were an integral part of my uh, academic life, and they were, they were parts of, of my own inspiration to move forward, and so it is, it's wonderful to be with them again here. Um, the Honors College is really happy to uh, sponsor this event because in some way I think Pope Benedict XVI, Joseph Ratzinger, um, embodies the spirit of our curriculum. The Honors College curriculum is organized uh, in, a, in a progression, ancient, Christian, modern, modern Christian. So we have two semesters of the ancients. Right, a semester of the Christians in scripture, Augustine and Aquinas, two semesters of the moderns, everybody from Machiavelli and Descartes to the American founders, but then Christianity gets a response uh, at the end of their junior year before we go into a crisis of the West senior year where we read more Ratzinger, de Lubach, others as well. Um, and right, Joseph Ratzinger, I think, in many ways embodies that curriculum. Right? He is so well steeped in all three of those, it doesn't do them enough justice to call them perspectives, but, but those authors and those traditions. Last year, uh, when we did our summer school program for high school students, which is a great books program for high school students, it was on love and friendship was our theme, and we started off with Plato's Symposium, and a young, pious Catholic girl um, sent me a pretty intense email that um, accused me of being a pretty bad Catholic for having them read the symposium because there are some uh, understandings of love that are not quite Catholic, uh, advocated by some of the speakers, and uh, it kind of threw me for a bit, and I, I had to sit and kind of carefully, you know, uh, write a response to her. And lo and behold, my appeal to authority was the symposium is mentioned in right, Ratzinger's. Um, uh, encyclical, right, Deus Caritas Est, right? Um, and in fact, it's one of the speeches that, where there's not uh, a quite Catholic understanding of love mentioned. And, and so Ratzinger is well steeped in Plato and Aristotle, right, in scripture, and in his introduction to Christianity, right, is engaging with modernity, right? He doesn't simply hold his ears and say to modernity, I'm not listening, I'm not listening, right? He's going to fruitfully engage with it. And so, um, with that said, uh, we're absolutely delighted to, to have uh, to promote uh, and support this conference. Now to Dr. DeClue's more lengthy um, introduction. Dr. DeClue originally majored in pre-veterinary medicine and biology with a chemistry minor at the University of Florida, 
Findlay, in fin oh, Findlay, oh gosh, University of Findlay in Findlay, Ohio, where he served as a tutor in math and chemistry. Eventually, he would receive certifications in professional teaching knowledge and general science through the American Board for Certification of Teacher Excellence. In January of 2000, when I was a freshman, he transferred to Belmont Abbey College. As a student, he was co-founder and first president of the Brothers in Christ, Sons of Mary men's household, and graduated in 2002 with a BA in theology. His undergraduate thesis was on the theological implications of genetic research. After a year of graduate studies at Boston College, Dr. DeClue pursued three graduate ecclesiastical degrees at the Catholic University of America including the degree of Doctor of Sacred Theology in Systematic Theology. Both his STL thesis and doctoral dissertation focused on the thought of Pope Benedict XVI, particularly his Eucharistic ecclesiology and his theology of divine revelation. Dr. DeClue has taught undergraduate courses here at Belmont Abbey College, including a course on Pope Benedict XVI and at the Catholic University of America. He has published on the thought of Pope Benedict XVI in such peer-reviewed journals as Communio and Nova Ad Vitera. He has also written uh, multiple articles in the Word on Fire Institute's quarterly journal, Evangelization and Culture. Since December 2020, Dr. DeClue has served as the Cardinal Henri de Lubac Fellow of Theology at the Word on Fire in, uh, Institute based in Dallas, Texas. He has written a book on the life and thought of Pope Benedict XVI, which is currently in the editing stages. In addition to his work on Pope Benedict XVI, Dr. DeClue is passionate about authentic interpretations of the Second Vatican Council. His six-part series on Vatican II, called Authority and Continuity, is available on the Word on Fire Institute's YouTube channel. He has also spoken about the history of the church and science at two conferences sponsored by the John Templeton Foundation and the Word on Fire Institute. In two weeks, he will be speaking at the University of Dallas for the American Maritime Association's annual conference. His, presenta his presentation today is entitled Making Common Cause, Maritime for Communio, nope, that's the title at the conference, never mind. <laughs> Maritain for Communio Theologians. Today, Dr. DeClue will be speaking on the unity of Pope Benedict's theology. Please welcome me in joining Dr. DeClue. Or, join me in welcoming, rather. Well, thank you for that warm introduction, and I have fond memories of speaking with you as well as a student. Um, actually, the thought that came to mind is Jesus sitting and asking them questions. Um, now Dr. Waisaki was always, he's always interested in asking other people about their studies here. He wasn't just interested in his own major, but would go around like, all right, well, what do you think about this? And like, he'd very, you know, and I'm sure you guys have all experienced that, he's always a wonderful person to talk to about pretty much anything. Um, so when I was asked to give a, an address, the keynote address for this um, event, um, in my humility, when they asked me, well, what topic would you like to talk about, um, I basically said everything. Um, it's, obviously, that's not possible, but in a certain sense, I'm, I'm not joking. Um, and I hope that it will become apparent by the time we get to the end of this. I'm going to cover a lot, but I'm hoping that you will see why. The volume of Pope Benedict XVI's writings is immense. As a theologian, he wrote hundreds of articles and at least 50 books. As Pope, he wrote encyclicals, apostolic exhortations, penned the three-volume Jesus of Nazareth series, and gave numerous public speeches. What is more, he wrote on almost every major area in theology. Theologians typically focus their written work on a select few topics. Even within a given area of theology, such as biblical studies or systematic theology, theologians tend to specialize in a subtopic such as Pauline literature or ecclesiology. Pope Benedict, however, has published works on theological method, 
fundamental theology, biblical exegesis, Trinitarian theology, theological anthropology, Christology, ecclesiology, liturgy and sacraments, moral theology, eschatology, and more. Despite the stunning breadth of his work, one can discern an overarching unity. The various aspects of his thought are parts of a larger whole. Each area is related to the others. In this way, his theological corpus is extremely Catholic in the etymological sense. Most of us are familiar with the idea that Catholic means universal. However, there is another layer of meaning to the word that is less widely known, one that Dr. Thomas actually mentioned earlier today. Catholic comes from a Greek term meaning according to the whole. It has the connotation of integrality, of containing all of the component parts in their proper relation. Thus, the various aspects of the Catholic faith comprise a single unified mystery. Pope Benedict is an outstanding example of a theologian whose work exemplifies this beautiful truth. In this presentation, I will provide a sketch of the unity of Pope Benedict's theological vision. It is my contention that the concept of communion is the leitmotif that unites his various works together in their mutual relation, which is fitting for that is precisely the meaning of the term communion itself. This theme of communion is rooted in the doctrine of the Trinity and thus serves as the hermeneutical key through which we can perceive the overarching unity of the Catholic faith as exhibited in Pope Benedict XVI's writings. Accordingly, I will show how the notion of communion is central to almost every major area of Catholic doctrine and theology, um, and I'm not going to give you the whole laundry list here, but you'll see as I go through. Um, in my estimation, the origin and foundation of Ratzinger's use of the concept of communion is the Trinity. This is appropriate because theology is about God, as the name suggests. Everything in theology should be related to God. As Ratzinger insists, God is, and the Christian faith adds, God is as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three and one. This is the very heart of Christianity. For Pope Benedict, the revelation that God is triune has far-reaching consequences. It fundamentally changes our perception of reality itself. While we can know from natural reason that God exists and that he has certain attributes, we can only know the truth about the Trinity because God has revealed it to us. This revelation augments and even corrects the understanding of God that comes from natural philosophy. By extension, it also affects our grasp of metaphysics. Other than Aquinas, Aristotle is perhaps the most brilliant philosopher and metaphysician who ever lived. But without the aid of divine revelation, he came to false conclusions about God and about metaphysics. Aristotle divided the types of being into hierarchical categories. The highest rung on the metaphysical ladder is substance. Below this are various types of accidents, such as quality, quantity, and relation. At the risk of oversimplifying, for Aristotle, relation is an accidental type of existence that is the byproduct of the multiplicity multiplicity of imperfect finite beings. In Aristotle's view, as perfect being itself, God has no accidents, including relations. Aristotle was mistaken. He was correct that there are no accidents in God, but he was incorrect in his estimation of the category of relation. Commenting on Ratzinger's work, Aidan Nichols explains, quote, the Trinitarian dogma makes it clear that relation, which for Aristotle had been simply among the accidents or contingent circumstances of being, in fact stands beside substance as an equally primordial form of being. End quote. In contrast to Aristotle, relation is now understood 
as an aspect of the highest metaphysical reality, divine existence itself. As Ratzinger writes, according to Augustine and late patristic theology, the three persons that exist in God are in their nature relations. They are therefore not substances that stand next to each other, but they are real existing relations and nothing besides. In God, person means relation. Relation, being related, is not something super added to the person, but it is the person itself. This corresponds to Aquinas' definition of the divine persons as subsistent relations. In other words, the eternal communion of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is of the highest ontological importance. God, the source of all existence, is inherently communal. This affects not only our understanding of God, but of everything else, especially of humanity. Because God is relational, and humanity is made in the image and likeness of God, humans are also relational. Ratzinger himself insists upon this when he writes, quote, The real God is by his very nature entirely being for, Father, being from, Son, and being with, Holy Spirit. Man, for his part, is God's image precisely insofar as the from, with, and for constitute the fundamental anthropological pattern, end quote. Again, he writes that man is God's image in his concrete reality, which is relationship. Pope Benedict's theological anthropology, then, is firmly connected to the doctrine of the Trinity. According to Ratzinger, humanity's communal nature is reflected in the mutuality of the sexes. Genesis 1.27 had portrayed mankind from the very beginning as masculine and feminine in its likeness to God, and had mysteriously, cryptically linked its likeness to God with the mutual reference of the sexes to each other. Accordingly, he also writes that Eve is depicted as the necessary opposite pole of man, Adam. His being without her would be not good. She comes not from the earth, but from himself. In the myth or legend of the rib is expressed the most intimate reference of man and woman to each other. In that mutual reference, the wholeness of humanity is first realized, end quote. In this way, Ratzinger shows that human nature is designed to be communal. We are meant to be in communion with one another. Humanity's communal nature includes not just the communion between human persons, but also the capacity for communion with God. Communion with God is, in fact, the reason humanity was created to begin with. Thus, the more we are in communion with God, the more fully human we become. As Ratzinger says, if the human person is all the more with itself and is itself, the more it is able to reach beyond itself, the more it is with the other, then the person is all the more itself, the more it is with the holy other, with God. Again, that's what we are made for. However, Sin has disrupted this plan. Sin is the antithesis of communion. Sin divides and separates that which is meant to be in proper relation. Sin disrupts our communion with God, and it disrupts our communion with one another. Correlatively, then, salvation, redemption from sin, must heal the broken relationships that sin has caused. This fact relates directly to our next topic. Christology and Soteriology, or Theology of Salvation. Sin creates a rift between God and humanity, but the Incarnation establishes the greatest possible instance of communion between God and man, the hypostatic union of the divine and human natures in Jesus Christ. The salvation that Christ brings is rooted in this metaphysical truth of the union of the divine and human in Christ. Christ. 
Jesus is much more than a wise teacher or moral exemplar. He is not just an interesting religious figure on par with other religious figures. Rather, as Ratzinger firmly insists, quote, that which makes Jesus important and irreplaceable in every age is precisely the fact that he was and is the son, that in him God has become man, end quote. Again, he writes, it is only if Jesus was God, only if God became man in him, that something actually took place in him. Because Jesus is God the Son, he is uniquely capable of making God known to us, even through his humanity. There can be no greater means of divine revelation, of God's self-communication to humanity, than the life, words, and saving work of Jesus Christ. In short, writes Ratzinger, this means that Christ in the flesh, the visible historical Jesus, and inclusively his entire visible life's work, is designated as revelatio, as revelation of the divinity, end quote. By making God known to us in an unsurpassable way, Christ communicates, note the shared root between communicate and communion, Christ communicates God to humanity. He makes God more fully known so that we can know and love God more, which is an aspect of reestablishing our communion with him. Of course, this reestablishment of communion with God includes the redemption from sin accomplished through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Through the Paschal mystery, Jesus serves as the center of human history. Let me explain what Ratzinger means by this. Following Plotinus and Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite, the great scholastic theologians of the Middle Ages spoke about a twofold movement a movement proceeding forth from God in creation, and a movement back towards God in salvation. The proceeding forth from God is called the exitus, the returning back to God is called the reditus. God is both the origin and the end, that from which all things come and the goal towards which all things tend. As the eternal word through whom all things were created, God the Son is at the origin of creation, inaugurating the exitus. As the incarnate word, Jesus Christ also inaugurates the reditus, the return of creation back to God. As Ratzinger summarizes, all reality is carried away in the great circular movement which proceeds from God and through Christ, the turning point of the world, all is again led back to God, end quote. He is the one through whom communion between God and his creation takes place. His very existence marks the turning point where that which came forth from God reverses course and heads back towards the creator. If the Trinity is the source and foundation of the motif of communion in Ratzinger's thought, Christ is the center, the one who mediates the restoration of communion between God and humanity. Christ is also the center of the restoration of communion within humanity. Quote, For he came in order to gather together what was dispersed. His entire work is thus to gather the new people. End quote. This new people is the church. We can thus begin to see a connection between Christology and ecclesiology. Earlier, we stated that an essential aspect of human nature is communal, and that sin disrupted communion between God and humanity and the communion between human persons. We have seen that Christ's redemption is aimed at reestablishing communion. As Thomas Rausch explains, from de Lubach, Ratzinger also drew this patristic understanding of the mystery of Christ as a mystery of unity that heals the separations and divisions that are the results of sin. According to Ratzinger, humanity's reunion with God, what he calls the vertical communion, is also the basis for reuniting humanity, what he calls horizontal communion. Qu quote, communion with God 
is the path to interpersonal communion among men, end quote. This communion with God that is also a communion between human persons is precisely the essence of the church. As Ratzinger writes, the church is the dynamic process of horizontal and vertical unification. It is vertical unification which brings about the union of man with the triune love of God, thus also integrating man in and with himself. Only by the impulse power of vertical unification can horizontal unification, by which I mean the coming together of divided humanity, also successfully take place. The church, then, is the principal effect of Christ's saving work. The whole goal of Christ's redemptive sacrifice is to bring humans back into relationship with God and with one another. The church is the beginning of this reality taking place. It is therefore not accidental to salvation. It is the intended result of salvation. It is part of salvation itself. Pope Benedict has written extensively on the church, and I personally think some of his best work is on ecclesiology. And this theme of communion comes up time and again in his writings on the church. In the Greek New Testament, the word for church is ecclesia. In the Greek Old Testament, ecclesia is used to translate the Hebrew word kahal, Q-A-H-A-L. So in order to understand the meaning of church, we need to understand something about this Hebrew term. Kahal means assembly, but in the Old Testament, it is a religiously significant word. It designates the people of God, Israel, gathered together to receive and adhere to God's proclamations. It is in this sense that it is used to refer to the gathering of the people at Mount Sinai. Later in Israel's history, the people were scattered away from the promised land in what is now called the diaspora. In light of this, the Jewish people began to pray that God would gather his people together again to reestablish his kahal. Ratzinger understands the church in light of this background. He writes, It is thus clear what it means for the nascent church to call herself ecclesia. By doing so, she says, in effect... This petition is granted in us. Christ who died and rose again is the living Sinai. Those who approach him are the chosen final gathering of God's people. In his book, Principles of Catholic Theology, Ratzinger directly connects the notion of the church as communion with the communion of the triune God. He insists that, quote, Belief in the Trinity is communio. To believe in the Trinity means to become communio. The oneness of the believing subject is the necessary counterpart and consequence of the known object. End quote. In other words, those who are in communion with God are called to be in communion with one another. That is part of what it means to become like God. According to Ratzinger, ecclesial communion involves both doctrinal and institutional aspects. Referring to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42, he notes how the members of the church after Pentecost dedicated themselves to the teaching of the apostles, doctrine and institution. As he says, what fellowship with the apostles means is now specified as persistent remaining in the teaching of the apostles. Unity thus has a content that is expressed in teaching. The teaching of the apostles is the practical mode of their abiding presence in the church. Thanks to this teaching, the future generations after the death of the apostles also remain in unity with them and thus constitute the same one apostolic church. Ratzinger further notes the sacramental dimension of ecclesial communion. For as Acts 2 states, the early church also dedicated itself to the breaking of the bread. Thus, Ratzinger writes, fellowship in the body of Christ and in receiving the body of Christ means fellowship with one another. The Greek word for fellowship in Acts is koinonia, which means, you guessed it, communion.
And we see in Acts a reference to the centrality of Holy Communion. It's no accident that the Eucharist is called Holy Communion. For the church as communion. Hence, the notion of communion is also key for understanding the sacraments. The communion with God and with our fellow humanity in the church is offered to us through the sacraments, especially baptism and Holy Communion. In Introduction to Christianity, Ratzinger shows how this is reflected in John's portrayal of the crucifixion, where blood and water pour forth from the side of Christ, which harkens back to the creation of woman from the side of Adam. Quote, The open side of the new Adam repeats the mystery of the open side of man at creation. It is the beginning of a new definitive community of men with one another, a community symbolized here by blood and water, in which John points to the basic Christian sacraments of baptism and Eucharist, and through them to the church as the sign of the new community of men. Again, he writes, through baptism, we are inserted into Christ and united with him as a single subject, no longer many alongside one another, but only one in Christ Jesus. This communion between Christ and his church inaugurated in baptism is renewed and consummated through the Holy Eucharist. As St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, the cup of blessing that we bless Is it not a communion in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a communion in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. The church is the body of Christ by receiving the body of Christ. Therefore, in Pope Benedict's view, the church and the Eucharist are mutually constitutive. He asserts that according to the fathers, Eucharist and church do not stand as two different things next to one another, but fall thoroughly into one another. Again, he insists, the formula, the church is the body of Christ, thus states that the Eucharist, in which the Lord gives us his body and makes us one, forever remains the place where the church is generated. In the Eucharist, the church is most compactly herself. Again, appealing to the notion that the church is the new Eve coming forth from the new Adam on the cross, Ratzinger thinks that the church is the body of Christ as the bride of Christ. He writes that the church is the body not by virtue of an identity without distinction, but rather by means of the pneumatic real act of spousal love. Expressed in another way, this means that Christ and the church are one body in the sense in which man and woman are one flesh. That is, in a, such a way that in their indissoluble spiritual bodily union, they nonetheless remain unconfused and unmingled. In light of all this, Ratzinger holds that the unity of the church is of paramount importance. Christ established one church as his bride. Thus, we can only be fully members of Christ's body by being members of his one bride, the church. In order to manifest and maintain the unity of the church, Christ established the church with hierarchical structure. Christ builds this structure on the foundation of the apostles. The choice of 12 apostles is not arbitrary. It harkens back to the 12 tribes of Israel. Although there are 12 tribes, they comprise one people. Similarly, although there are 12 apostles, they constitute one apostolic college, with one of them, Peter, being the focal point of unity between them. Ratzinger contends that this unity of the apostolic college around Peter must persist in the unity of the college of bishops around the successor of Peter. Maintaining this unity is central to the very purpose of the apostolic ministry. The church's communion is realized at various levels, keeping the church together. The bishop of the local particular church, what we call a diocese, is the point of unity within his local church. By maintaining communion with the local bishop, the flock under his care are united together. 
Then, because the local bishop is in communion with the bishop of Rome, and through him with the other bishops, his people are also united with the bishop of Rome. Thus, unity is guaranteed on both the local and universal levels through the hierarchical communion of the successors of the apostles and the people under their care. The universality of this ecclesial communion is extremely important to Ratzinger. As he writes, the church cannot become a static juxtaposition of essentially self-sufficient local churches. The church must remain apostolic. That is to say, the dynamism of unity must also mold her structure. That's why in his debate with Cardinal Casper regarding the relation between the local particular church and the universal church, Ratzinger emphasizes the priority of the universal church. As he writes, what first exists is the one church, the church that speaks in all tongues, the Ecclesia Universalis. She then generates church in the most diverse locales, which nonetheless are all always embodiments of the one and only church. The temporal and ontological priority lies with the universal church. What is more, this universal communion of the church is fundamentally important for the proper celebration of the Eucharist. Again, the church and the Eucharist belong together, and communion is the key to understanding both. Hence, Ratzinger understands the papacy as a Eucharistic office, precisely as the ministry that keeps the various celebrations of the Eucharist around the world united together as one Eucharist. As Monsignor Paul McPartland writes, long before he became prefect for the congregation, Joseph Ratzinger already held that the primacy of the Pope does not primarily concern either orthodoxy or orthopraxy, but rather ortho-Eucharist. Again, as Ratzinger's former student, Maximilian Heinrich Heim relates, every celebration of the Eucharist inherently presupposes a visible concrete unity as an essential structural element. Accordingly, the commemoration of the Pope and the Bishop in the Eucharistic prayer during the Mass is not something incidental. Rather, it is an expression of this unity, for it means, in Ratzinger's opinion, that we are truly celebrating the one Eucharist of Jesus Christ, which we can receive only in the one church. In Ratzinger's own words, the Eucharist is celebrated with the one Christ and thus with the whole church, or it is not being celebrated at all. Ecclesial communion and Eucharistic communion are two aspects of one and the same reality. Thus, the Eucharist calls for and effects the communion of the one church throughout the world. Finally, the sacraments impart sanctifying grace, which thus enables the church's members to live holy lives. Therefore, sacraments are also tied to moral theology. In his post-synodal apostolic exhortation, Sacramentum Caritatis, the Sacrament of Charity, Pope Benedict XVI insists that Christianity's new worship includes and transfigures every aspect of life. Christians, in all their actions, are called to offer true worship to God. Here, the intrinsically Eucharistic nature of Christian life begins to take shape. The Eucharist, since it embraces the concrete, everyday existence of the believer, makes possible, day by day, the progressive transformation of all those called by grace to reflect the image of the Son of God. As we've already seen, salvation reestablishes the communion between God and humanity and the communion of humans with one another in the church. It also involves reestablishing the integrity of the individual human person. In a way, it involves enabling unity within ourselves putting an end to the internal battles between temptation to sin and the desire to do the good. Hence, the sacraments of healing, confession and anointing of the sick, are also connected to our theme. They heal the, integ the integrity of the individual person, as well as restore, heal, and strengthen the person's unity with God and his church. Furthermore, 
Since morality can be summarized in the two great commandments to love God and to love our neighbor, moral theology is also intimately tied to the theme of communion. It is about living first in right relationship with God and flowing from this, living in right relationship with others. Hence, after referencing love of God and love of neighbor, Benedict XVI teaches that faith, worship, and ethos are interwoven as a single reality which takes shape in our encounter with God's agape. Here, the usual contraposition between worship and ethics simply falls apart. Worship itself, Eucharistic communion, includes the reality both of being loved and of loving others in turn. The command to love God and neighbor transcends earthly life. Quote, even when they have crossed over the threshold of the world beyond, human beings can still carry each other and bear each other's burdens. They can still give to each other, suffer for each other, and receive from each other. End quote. That is why we pray for the dead and ask the saints in heaven to pray for us, which leads to our final topic, eschatology. Eschatology, the theology of the last things, is also communal. Salvation isn't just about me and Jesus. As Ratzinger notes, the concept of a Christianity concerned only with my soul, in which I seek only my justification before God, my saving grace, my entrance into heaven, is for de Lubac that caricature of Christianity that in the 19th and 20th centuries made possible the rise of atheism. De Lubach, for his part, is convinced that Christianity is, by its very nature, a mystery of union, end quote. Salvation and sin are opposites. Sin divides, grace unites. Quote, the essence of original sin is the split into individuality, which knows only itself. The essence of redemption is the mending of the shattered image of God the union of the human race through and in the one who stands for all and in whom, as Paul says, are all are one, Jesus Christ. To be a Christian means to be Catholic, means to be on one's way to an all-embracing unity. Union is redemption, for it is the realization of our likeness to God, the three in one, end quote. That's why belief in the communion of saints is part of the creed. This makes sense when one recalls that heaven is a share in divine life. And as we have already established, divine life is communal. As Pablo Blanco Sarto elucidates Ratzinger's thought, the Christian heaven, the highest end of the human person, is personal and interpersonal, individual and relational. As Ratzinger himself writes, heaven is a stranger to isolation. It is the open society of the communion of saints, and in this way, the fulfillment of all human communion. This is not by way of competition with the perfect disclosure of God's face, but on the contrary, is its very consequence. By being united with God, we are united with all the others who are united with God, thereby reflecting the perfect Trinitarian communion. The fullness of salvation, even for the saints currently in heaven right now, will only come at the end of time, the eschaton, when there will be new heavens and a new earth, which includes the resurrection of the dead. For Pope Benedict, this perfection of creation and of others is also part of our own personal salvation precisely because of our communal nature. The fact that the awakening is expected on the last day, at the end of history, and in the company of all mankind, indicates the communal character of human immortality, which is related to the whole of mankind. For man understood as a unity, fellowship with his fellow men is constitutive. If he is to live on, then this dimension cannot be excluded, end quote. Again, he insists, the individual's salvation is whole and entire only 
when the salvation of the cosmos and all the elect has come to full fruition. For the redeemed are not simply adjacent to each other in heaven. Rather, in their being together as the one Christ, they are heaven. I know we've covered a lot, so let's try to bring it all together more compactly so we can see the connections more clearly. God is the eternal communion of three divine persons. Thus, relational communion is an inherent aspect of being itself. God created in order to bring this creation into communion with himself. In particular, God created human beings in his image and likeness, that is, as spiritual beings capable of knowing and loving, and therefore capable of intentional communion. Sin is the antithesis of communion. It divides us from God, from one another, and even from ourselves. Salvation, then, must heal the divisions created on these three levels. By becoming man... God the Son unites divinity and humanity together in an unsurpassable unity. Through his incarnation and redemptive death, Jesus inaugurates the way for man to once again be in communion with God. This vertical communion with God also serves as a means of bringing men into communion with one another. Thus, salvation in Christ generates the church, which, as Vatican II affirms, is like a sacrament or sign and instrument both of a very closely knit union with God and of the unity of the whole human race. Through the sacraments of initiation, we are incorporated into this church. We thereby enter into communion with God and with the whole church, as well as receive the graces necessary to live holy lives. In this way, our worship of God enables us to love God and our neighbor, fulfilling Christ's twofold command of love. Ultimately, our living of morally upright and holy lives is ordered towards heaven, where we become members of the communion of saints. Since heaven is a share in divine life, and divine life is precisely loving communion, heaven is the loving communion of man with God and with the entire communion of saints. Through all of his vast theological corpus, then, Pope Benedict XVI shows that Trinitarian theology theological anthropology, Christology, soteriology, ecclesiology, sacramental theology, moral theology, and eschatology are all inherently related. The key concept for the entirety of our Catholic faith is communion, founded upon the Trinity, centered on Christ, with the church as the principal effect, and the eternal communion of saints as the ultimate goal. In short, the triune God is is all in all. About 20 minutes or so for questions. Or as I think Abbott Placid used to say, questions, objections, observations, or announcements. Yes, I would say so. Correct. They're spiritual beings, which means they're capable of knowing and loving. The big difference here is that if you follow Aquinas on angelology, the metaphysics of angels, Bonaventure has a somewhat different view. When they make their choice, there's no redemption. If, if they fall and become demons, there's no becoming an angel again. They can't be redeemed by Christ because he can't, he doesn't become an angel. But if, so in in some sense, the angels never fell. So they were created in communion with God and they never lost it. And they even, you would say that they're elevated through grace. There's a, they still have a nature, but they can't, you know, their initial choice is their choice. There's no possibility of repentance or anything like that. But that's one reason we say that we've been elevated above the angels. We have something that they could never have, which is this unity of our nature with his in Christ. 
Yes, it's a good question. So basically the question is, being in communion doesn't just mean egalitarianism, right? It doesn't mean we're all the same and we all become like exactly the same. No, that's correct. Um, if you look at his ecclesiology, he's always emphasizing, that's why the image of the body of Christ is so powerful, because your body's beauty comes from the fact that it's made up of an integrity of parts, right? And each part plays its role for the sake of the whole. And without those parts, there's something missing. So we are individually, but this is important. This is why he's saying we need each other because none of us individually is the church. We are members of the body of Christ together as one, which also means, and this is an important, this is a very hard thing for us in the concrete to live out. Know your place. You're not the Pope. Right? So we can all sit around and play armchair quarterback and tell people how they need to do their job. And I'm not saying we don't all have opinions about that sort of thing. But in a certain sense, we can't be allergens. We can't be antihistamines. If we're doing nothing but attacking our own body, if we basically, our life as a Catholic is to constantly do nothing but attack the hierarchy, then you've become a rogue cell that's actually creating an allergic reaction within the church. And, you know, you need to fulfill your role. Be holy in your vocation first. It's not your job to go on Twitter and tell everyone what you think about everything. Like, and that's not even saying that there's not room for criticism and thinking things differently, but if that's, if that's all you're now focused on doing is saying what everyone else is doing wrong, well, then you're not fulfilling your role. The liver has its place. The kidney has its place. The hand has its place. The foot has its place. The heart has its place. The brain has its place. They all have to work together. And so that's why, you know, he's very big on this idea that the church is hierarchical. It has a structure. And that's good. If the body didn't have a skeleton, that would not be good. So you don't need to, to everyone has a different role, and that's the beauty of it. And you can become the holiest finger that ever existed that's better than someone else that serves as a, the head of a local church, for instance. You know, you can be a saint in any of those roles. And that's the point is, you know, it's probably more than what you were asking, but. Right, so you're talking about his article concerning the notion of person and theology, right? Yeah, so this could go on a long time if I don't try to keep it short. But if I recall correctly, because I didn't read it like yesterday, but his point is that we get the notion of person primarily through Christianity, through the, the, the questions about the Trinity and the questions about Christology, okay? So, there is no human person in Christ, right? But Christ is fully human, right? He's fully human, but he's not a human person. He's a divine person. So, the person that Christ, who is fully human, is, is a subsistent relation. He's not a separate substance. Now, I'm not saying, and I don't think Ratzinger's saying, that human persons aren't substances, He's not saying that hu human persons are persons the same way the Trinitarian persons are because everything is analogical. But if I recall correctly, in that article, what he's saying is the starting point for understanding the human person is the Trinity. He's not saying we're exactly the same, but I still think it holds. Christ is fully human and he's a subsistent relation and not a separate substance from the Father, right? So, his, but what his point is, he actually criticizes Augustine in that article. He's not saying that the psychological analogy of the Trinity is wrong, but he thinks it's missing something because the psychological analogy basically takes 
the unity of the one divine nature in three persons and flips it in man and says that the unity or that the unity is the human person and the diversity is the known, the knower, and the knowing, right? Or the lover, the beloved, and the loving, which is interior to one person. So now you've taken the three persons of God and you've equated them with one person and his internal operations. He's not saying that's not a helpful analogy, but he says it's missing something and we need to complement it and understand that a human person does not image God solely by himself. And that's what he's saying. Yes, you are a substance, okay, in a way that, you know, the, the, the Trinitarian persons are not separate substances. Okay, true. But you are related to others. You don't image the Trinity by yourself alone. Just like the Trinitarian persons are related, you as a human person are by nature related to other human persons. So that's what he's trying to do. Now, I would say this is a side note. He completely misunderstands Boethius in that article. In a footnote in my book, I actually point that out. He mis- I think he misunderstands the, the use of substance in Boethius, and he mistakes it. And I think that's part of his critique of Boethius, is he's misunderstanding. Because remember, Greek philosophy had primary and secondary substance. I think he misreads which one Boethius is using, if that helps. Yeah, um, the one difficulty with particularities is they are particular to your particular circumstances in life and your environment and all that. But he, he doesn't think, I don't really want to get into his theology of politics um, because it's very complicated. And, but he doesn't think your Christian faith is meant to be lived privately. If you're at work and you're eating lunch at your desk or in the cafeteria and you're not saying grace before meals because you're afraid people will see it, there's a problem. Um, He says at one point, should we have crucifixes in our schools? Yes, but if we can't convince our society that we should, maybe we don't deserve it. Um, Basically, his, his sentence was like, live your faith and don't be ashamed of it. And don't feel like you have to cave in to whatever the popular cultural narrative is now. That's what led to Nazis taking over. Is when people were willing to say, well, that's where the crowd's going. If I don't, I'm in trouble. Be willing to be a martyr. Don't let your faith be some private thing that you keep to yourself and, you know, separate from the rest of your life. Like if you're in business... Be just in your business dealings. It's not about screwing the other guy so you can make a bigger buck. Don't try to get an unfair deal. If he deserves more for the product he's giving you or vice versa, like do that. Do what's just. Don't do what you can get away with. So I don't know if that answers your question, but... <clears throat> 
Right. So if I could summarize it, do you mean basically what is he thinking about enculturation in the liturgy? Yes. Yeah. All right. So very difficult topic, but it's a very important one. Um, again, our faith is incarnational. So it does, it has to be lived out in culture of some sort. There's no way of having a non-cultural liturgy, so to speak, right? Um, The diversity is good. And the liturgy should be enculturated. That's that's why we have 23 sui juris Eastern Catholic churches. Um, Now, most of them are under the Byzantine umbrella, so the liturgical diversity is not quite as extensive as that. But there is liturgical diversity, and there always has been, and there always should be. But when it comes to enculturation, he's very, he's got a nuanced approach, which is, yes, enculturation, but slowly, and with purification. So the church and the liturgy can take on any culture after it's been purified. You can take the best of a culture and adapt it. But you can't just take anything from a culture because all cultures have weaknesses. All cultures have things that are not appropriate for the liturgy. And this is actually one of his big gripes is in this day and age when everyone's talking about enculturation and how important that is, he says, then how come the one, I'm highly paraphrasing here, okay? Um, How come the one culture we're not allowed to have in the liturgy is the Latin culture? Of the Roman, it's the Roman rite. So why is that? Why has it become the utility right where it's insert your culture here? Like why? And his point actually is that, like Gregorian chant, polyphony, all of those things, the art, the architecture. Those are particularly suited to the Roman rite because they were creations of a Catholic Christian culture. The culture was purified. First, it then created that music and that art and that and those things. And therefore, that's why those are particularly suited to the liturgy in a way that pop culture music and art is not. Because those that sacred art was created as sacred art. It wasn't some other art that was then adapted. It wasn't some kind of music that was then adapted. It actually was created from its beginning in a culture already Christianized. And it's within that, after a culture has been Christianized, then its elements can be brought into the liturgy. I hope that answers the question. Okay, so basically the question um, is, what's the relationship between truth and dialogue, right? Um, this actually, I'm going to say, give an anecdote. When I was a master's student at Boston College for the one year I was there, um, I attended a lecture given by, I'm not going to say the name, it was given by a person who was later censured by Joseph Ratzinger as head of the CDF. And it was Catholic pluralism on religious pluralism comparing Rahner and Schielebecks. And the guy was citing on the side of Schielebecks. He was basically saying that, just to put it in brass tacks, if a Buddhist is saved, it has nothing to do with Christ. That's what this Catholic theologian was saying. And he said, if you ask me why, it makes interreligious dialogue easier. Well, as one of my other professors said, Um, it's not dialogue if you give up your position before you even start, right? And I I said to 
one of my classmates, I said, well, this is a really strange position. I said, it seems to me that the whole purpose of dialogue is that you both think you have an idea of the truth and you're sharing it to try to come to unpack who's right. So that the purpose of the dialogue is a greater grasp of truth. My fellow classmate said, I don't think truth is the purpose of dialogue. And that was that, end of discussion. Oh, she said, I don't think truth is the purpose of dialogue. And I honestly just didn't, uh, that was the end of the discussion. There was nothing more we could talk about. <laughs> but this is, this is huge in Ratzinger's um, writings because he uses St. Augustine in his conversion as an example. And he talks about part of his conversion happened through dialogue with people. But the, there's a presupposition to a dialogue. A dialogos can only happen if there's a logos that the presupposition is that there, you are both committed to the truth, whatever it is. So the truth has to precede the dialogue. The dialogue is a means of clarifying that and coming to hopefully both embrace the truth, whatever it is. So that it's the dialogue or the truth, there's an assumption of the truth and the dialogue is, in, is geared towards trying to attain that truth. So does that answer your question?